Right. Everybody good? Interpretation teams should disclose on the wiki over the course of the entire season. B is the violation they didn't. C is the standards. First is small schools. Disclosure creates proliferation of arguments, which compensates for research disparities created by coaching staff, and also checks back for costs of extra coaching briefs and scouting benefits enabled by larger pool entry. Second is argument transparency. Disclosure establishes what arguments are being run on the topic and allows for more presentation and ensuring substantive debates rather than tricky anti-educational arguments. It also prevents evidence abuse and discourages unethical miscut sources. Third is reciprocity. We disclose when a prep was created in this round. We've disclosed on every topic they've disclosed once, giving them an unfair strategic advantage. D is the voters. First is education. They have undermined the core benefits debate and actively promote a system that prevents the educational impacts to the standards outlined above. Second is fairness. They have prevented argument clash and gave an advantageous imbalance from teams being disclosed in the wiki. Theory is a prior question to the contents of the case. If they disclosed, the contents would have been different. If we win the disclosure is a good practice, you should drop them to encourage that practice. Default to competing interpretations. Our first contention is health. Sanctions have caused a health crisis in Venezuela in two different ways. First is prevention of sickness. Stark and 19 find that since sanctions have destroyed the legitimacy of companies, that although sanctions allow for delivery of humanitarian assistance, shipments of medicine are likely to diminish. Organizations and financial institutions ear on the side of caution when the U.S. policy explicitly allows for the delivery of certain goods. Second is a doctor drain. As a result of decreasing imports, we've run in 19 finds that 220,000 doctors, about one-third of the total of left the countries, due to tightening sanctions. Due to these two warrants, Rogers in 19 finds that in Venezuela, compared to last earlier last year, imports of medicine and other healthcare products have decreased 98.7%, which is why Reesbra continues that sanctions have inflicted very serious harms to human life and including more than 40,000 deaths from 20, 2017 to 2018 alone. But the problem is expected to get worse as DW finds in 2019 that 300,000 people who are currently estimated because of a lack of access to medicine because of sanctions in the country. Contention 2 is avoiding state collapse. Sanctions have accelerated economic collapse and hurt everyday Venezuelans. It's kind of folded in 17 finds that the Venezuelan economy is hanging on by a thread. Imposing sanctions on a country that has managed to exclude itself from international markets thanks to corrupt exchange rate systems has the potential to turn a dire situation into a catastrophe. And they have prevented economic reform. It's beaten in 19 finds that sanctions have prevented the government from taking measures that could get rid of hyperinflation and allow for economic recovery from a long depression. Economic recovery would be quick and effective absent sanctions. As Weisbrot and Sachs find in 2019 that there have been seven cases of, of hyperinflation in Latin America. In all cases, the government adopted a program to get rid of Hyperinflation. People cease to look at the domestic currency and instead look to the exchange rate. Stabilizing the exchange rate can quickly stabilize domestic prices as exchange rate based stabilization is done by creating a system with a fully convertible and a managed flow of currency. Venezuela would not need outside help to create such a system as the securitization of their oil would ultimately suffice to attract investment. However, Sanks and Weisbrot ultimately continue that sanctions based such a stabilization program impossible because they prevent debt restructuring necessary to resolve Venezuela's balance of payment crisis. Sanctions also prevent the government from pursuing a stabilization program because the peg to the dollar would require access to a dollar based financial system. Its effect is to lock Venezuela into a downward economic spiral. The absence of sanctions is not just zero net excess deaths, but an actual reduction in mortality and other improvements to vital health indicators. But instead of allowing for this reform, sanctions put the economy in free-for-all. We brought in 19 finds that they have drastically reduced the ability of Venezuela to sell oil and any foreign assets. A baseline projection of Venezuela's real GDP shows an unprecedented decline of 37% in 2019, and imports are projected to fall by 39%. The impact is a failed state. Sanctions have already caused a massive refugee exodus. As Washington office in Latin America in 19 finds that sanctions intensify suffering that millions of Venezuelans are enduring. Venezuelans are currently out, out facing widespread scarcity of essential medicine that have left to 3 million people ref being refugees being at risk. Millions are suffering from a food crisis, which is driving mass migration to Sherberts. In 19, by the food insecurity amount of nutrition at sky high levels, the Venezuela minimum wage, which is around $7 a month, only covers 4.7% of food. More than 80% of households are food insecure, and 3.7 million Venezuelans are malnourished. They have failed every objective and only pushed the country closer to the brink, as Rodriguez in 19 finds that two years in, Maduro retains his grip on power, and the regime is becoming even more <coughs> repressive and ruthless. Sanctions are now putting the country at risk of a humanitarian catastrophe. Venezuela's imports barely a third of what it did last year and a tenth of what it did in 2012. Further cuts to foreign purchasing could produce a famine in Latin America for the first time in over a century. If they do not end, Venezuela will become a failed state. As O'Hallon in 19 finds that Venezuela teeters on the break of becoming a failed state in future months with the oil embargo kicking in the scale of the problem may soon get much worse. It is easy to imagine scenarios in which tens of millions of refugees in Venezuela become refugees with many million more inside the country struggling just to stay alive. Right,
Counter-troop schools that have more than five teams plus the schools in the NECA PS 15 minutes before the round of TOC yeah. qualifying tournaments and round robins. Free for me, reasons users prefer one or more educational, saucy offense file, lit and prep. The most successful arguments are fully disclosed for everyone to research. Be it saucer, in-depth education award by establishing a scope for arguments and topic understanding about the harms of maintaining disclosure for, uh, for disadvantaged schools. Two were fair. Mandatory disclosure hurts some small schools because large school prep as there's no risk of people advantage disclosure for small schools. The counter-troop solves back for compared to small schools too. Be the status quo proves that disclosure happens not mandating. But then three, the horse for education, the only in to only true in run abuses that's concrete is they shift away from the topic specific, topic specific education caused by them running period. They don't, access, they don't access education because one, it's small scope. The impact decreases the longer we debate the topic, but two, none of the arguments we're reading are squirrely or brand new. We can clash every round that supercharges the in round loss of education. But then they also don't access fairness. One, disclosure is only a check against parametricizing apps because available net ground shifts depending on their ad efficacy. This is why disclosure is a norm in progressive LD and policy. Their ground based internal links aren't applicable. But number two, link defense. Actual abuse would be delinking everything because we aren't actually abiding by the resolution they pull the trigger before, they tr before trying to engage with us. But three, their intro says that we have to disclose before they coin flip. That kills fairness because they can't, sh they can't, they, they can't sift through the disclosed case, anyways. But then fairness is a determined voter. One, no one plays to play an unfair game. You can't get to your education impacts because we're beating you to the link. But two, fairness directly controls the education debate. These strand times two arguments available alone show how education completely declined in this round. Number three, we have plenty of places to get education but, uh, without the competitive aspect like school. Fair, fair competitive debate is a unique incentive that your education, that your education arguments don't take into account. Um, now to our case. First, the interest of reforming Venezuela's economy. Sanctions are pushing Maduro to reform the economy for two reasons. He first, it's the economic pressure. As a result of U.S. sanctions pressuring Venezuela's state-run industries, the country is now increasingly focusing on the private sector. Indeed, the anti U.S. sanctions have caused Maduro to take drastic steps towards the law and they shut the economy in order to encourage foreign investment in the advising countries. Like, second, it's regarding support. Cash money teamized Maduro's power the economy in order to better relations with investors and interested in the Venezuelan market, allowing him to use their support to lobby and pressure Trump to loosen sanctions on the country. The impact of these reforms can already be seen. The economic side teamized economic pressure through sanctions has forced the government to retreat from most of its long standing socialist policies, including that Maduro has become more economically flexible and inflation has dropped 95%. Maduro has even taken steps to prioritize Venezuela's state-run oil company PDVSA. The the social economy, prerogative viewers, 20 finds the sanctions have, have pushed Venezuela to start ceding oil operations to foreign firms. This is crucial as the Atlas Network 19 rights of prioritization make the oil sector more efficient, effective, and lucrative, driving broader economic freedom throughout the economy. Historically, the Center for Economic Policy and Research, OA, finds Venezuela's lifting of millions of households out of poverty in 2003 was nearly entirely due to growth in the power sector. Contention 3 is checking back abuse. Price of the CSI, uh, contention 2, sorry. Price of the CSI 19 finds that because sanctions have cut off Maduro's access to Venezuelan oil and gold industries, they have sort of limited his ability to conduct human rights violations and anti democratic, anti -democratic activities. They further that the constant pressure of sanctions have decreased his control over important institutions and support for the regime. This has forced Maduro to realign his interests with the people to help stabilize his government and maintain power. Indeed, Castro 19 writes that the Maduro government is making structural changes to improve the lives of Venezuelans in order to increase the support before parliamentary elections. For example, risk of crisis group Team rights that the Venezuelan government allowed Red Cross aid to enter the country after aggressively blocking shipments, indicating that they care about the well being of people. However, the New York Times 19 finds that aid led in will help 650,000 people within Venezuela. However, the impact of sanctions extends far beyond the, far beyond the country itself. By lifting sanctions prematurely, we, without, without achieving the full goal of the ousting of Maduro and facilitating peaceful change, the United States Census is unwilling to follow through with this threat and is all bark and no bite, affirming, that, affirming thereby erosive credibility of future attempts of using sanctions as a form of economic coercion. Indeed, Peterson of international studies confirms that lifting, lifting sanctions signals to future targets that resisting has no serious consequences. One find that lifting U.S. sanctions prematurely 
decreases the probability that future sanctions fail by 91%. I'm just going to read another contention. Contention 3, preventing rules of range Also, Hostile Burkitt's institutions range. Presidents often use sanctions in the middle ground between full scale intervention and doing nothing. Indeed, great president of the ITT 19 finds that Trump has used sanctions to avoid intervening in Venezuela militarily, just like he did with Iran earlier in the summer. In fact, even with the recent military strike on an Iranian general, to call LA Times 20 writes that Trump opted for increased sanctions over further military further military activity. Without sanctions, the 2020 election will leave with no choice but to intervene. The WPR 20 finds that Trump has maintained a strong stance against Venezuela because of the importance of Venezuelan American voters to Florida vote through to, in his image as a top leader to his base. An intervention would be disastrous as more of Foreign Affairs 19 writes that intervention would force the country into an anarchy, forcing 8 million Venezuelans to flee and thousands more to die from the strike itself. Even a limited intervention would create a destabilizing power vacuum in the region. Carter Brown University 18 writes that a century of US military coups and policies of military intervention have given rise to numerous paramilitaries and cartels increasing poverty and violence around Latin America. Actually, say that the aid ever got to the people, or it says that it was given. What does it say? It says that he allowed the Red Cross to get all the supplies into the country, and that is going to help. Them. Does it ever say it was given to the 650,000 people? Yes or no? I mean, the it literally said the Red Cross. He allowed the Red Cross to do anything he needed to do. The answer is no. It never got to the people. You can have a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, the evidence says that the Red Cross came in. Yeah, sure. it never it says it got to the actual people that needed it, but that's fine. Okay. Um, on debt restructuring, right? Sure. Um, so. You said that in 2017 they canceled a debt restructuring, right? Do you have any do you have, have any evidence that says if you remove sanctions right now, there's going to be debt restructuring? Yeah, we do. Um, what, what Valencia it? finds in 2019, this is something that's going to happen in a rebuttal, obviously. But Maduro has an incentive to restabilize the debt and to. That's not, I'm not talking about the incentive. Debt. I'm not talking about the incentive. I'm saying you read evidence in 2017 that Maduro okay. could renegotiate the debt. I got you. Any I got you. Evidence I know in 2020, you're wrong. he would. I know you're wrong with this. Our, our, our evidence finds that if he could, he would. No, no, he I'm not saying. I'm sanctions. not saying if he could. I'm saying can he even in the first place? Our investors are willing to talk to Maduro right now. Oh, this is the this is a big misstep in your argument. Our evidence. Literally says says they can do it independently because of Venezuela's vast oil reserves. It doesn't need foreign financing from what banks. That, what does that mean? What does that mean? Obviously, people have an incentive to invest in Venezuela because of their oil reserves. That's what our Reese Barton Sachs sure, evidence so says. It says that they don't need outside support and that ultimately I'm not that's talking about oil. I'm talking about restructuring of the debt. This is two different things. Yeah, they I'm both saying, go hand no, hand no, hand. Tyler, you're not answering the question. I'm saying your evidence says in 2017 they were talking about restructuring debt on bonds. I'm saying in 2020, do you have any evidence that says that if you remove sanctions, you will be able to Once, talk I'm about restructuring? I'm not going to. I was going to answer that question the exact same way I answered it before. I'm okay, not, I'm not, I'm not just going to wait time. Okay, yeah. you can say the same thing for the 650,000 stuff. All right. Um, so you say that aid. I guess like, okay, what incentive? Or give me one example of aid that Maduro has accepted aside from like the Red Cross, <laughs> from like maybe something like from the United States, right? Um, like UNICEF. Uh, we have evidence that says he signed an agreement with UNICEF. He allowed 2.8 million people to get water. Okay, when is that from? Uh, you know, uh, June, June 2019. June 2019. So I guess my my question is, what changes when you affirm? In when we affirm, we yeah. remove his incentive to the, for the reasons he's doing these things. Our argument is that, yes, it is probably true. If you're going to say that, you're going to make the argument that Maduro wasn't letting in aid. This is probably true pre-sanctions, because pre-sanctions, he didn't care about the people. Wait. Our argument is that because sanctions decrease his ability to consolidate power. So you're telling me sanctions have made a socialist leader suddenly care about people. Not a socialist leader, an authoritarian leader, first of all. But the evidence is very specifically, because think about this, an authoritarian leader can either get government uh, power from the military, or he can get it from the people by pandering to them. Our argument is in the long run, because Maduro <laughs> perceives he has less of an ability to consolidate power with the military yeah, yeah, generals, he has to appeal to I got you. All right. You got a question? Yeah. Um, so you said that doctors are going to be leaving, right? Yeah. So you said that they're leaving because of sanctions. That's what our evidence Your says. evidence says that sanctions are bad, and then it says because of the crisis they're leaving. So, do you have any evidence that says? So, okay, so, wait. Um, I guess the. This is like an things. overarching theme. Yeah, I got you, I got you. So, the Zachariasen evidence says that aid is declining now because of the imposition of sanctions and medical imports have dropped 98% next, last year because of sanctions. There's a layer.
theory is not a reverse issue, it's a voting issue. You don't win the debate for proving that you aren't unfair and anti-educational, but you still lose the debate if you are. RBIs are bad because they discourage theories and options to check back against abusive debate practices that harm the quality of activity. Go to case. Their first, oh, their first contention is about reforming the economy, but realize, one, Washington Post finds in 2019 that actually all the reforms they talk about are inherently short-term and aren't going to help the people of Venezuela in the long term simply because they can't. That's our immediate evidence from 2019 that's from our case that tells you they can't actually solve hyperinflation in the long term effectively when you have sanctions on them, you can't access the international banks. Their first warns about liberalization, but in order for this for their work, you need the private sector to fly. However, they can't in a world with sanctions. Creighton finds in 2019 that financial institutions and other people don't want to help these private, institu or private co companies in a world with sanctions because it looks like they're helping a sanctioned government, which obviously they don't want to do, which is important because Zerpa finds in 2019 that actually the amount of imports that have gone into the country without free taxes have decreased, and this is from December 31st, which means even how post these reforms, the amount of the, the general trend of liberalization is now going down. Their second warrants about support doesn't go away in a world without sanctions. If he wants per personal support and investment support, he's going to pass policies that help his economy, which is probably a link into our debt restructuring argument, even in a world post sanctions. All their impact about the economy doing better. You realize they just tell you inflation is dropping, not the uh, economy is doing better. One, we tell you Forbes in 2019 finds the economic crisis is going to be continuing throughout 2025 because of sanctions, which means we would tell you that in their world, the economy is still really bad and people can't get access to food, which is important because even if they went the sort of hyperinflation is decreasing the streets, Times since 2018, that a lot of these reforms actually don't uh, allow people to, people still can't get food, what they talk about, which means that their arguments don't make a lot of sense. Their argument about the uh, sort of oil argument, one, if they, in a world with sanctions, they can't really trade a lot of their oil, even if it's privatized, which means they don't get a lot of profit. Other second contention about checking back abuse. One, our Rogers evidence from case tells you that on net, the amount of humanitarian aid and medicine that went down after sanctions dropped 98.7% because of sanctions. You should call for the card, it's really good. Secondly, Zarkin's in 2019, by actually sanctions block a majority of this humanitarian aid that we see happen, which is why they can't really tell you an impact about this humanitarian aid. They just tell you it's planned on going there, but you realize the sanctions block them. Third, their argument is that now Maduro cares about the well-being. No reason that changes post-sanctions. If anything, he probably accepts the aid now because there's a crisis going on, and there's no reason that would change before sanctions. You could probably apply their public support argument here because he cares about the people, and then he's going to accept aid. But fourth, you can actually turn this argument against them because Rotten finds in 2019 that uh, the sort of United States sanctions frozen a lot of banks with in Venezuela that were working with nonprofit or that nonprofits, they froze a lot of banks of the nonprofits, which means those companies could not actually get the funds that were accepting aid before. On their impact about sanctions going sort of spilling over, one, no reason Venezuela spills over to all other sanctions uh, globally. If we, if we remove sanctions because we think they were not doing good, that doesn't mean we remove sanctions elsewhere. Second, we have sort of taken sanctions off countries before and their argument didn't happen that we see happening. But third, we would tell you Smith the 2018 finds that in general sanctions fill or sanctions only work 10% of the time, which means their argument is really improbable. Go to their argument about intervention. A bunch of reasons it doesn't happen. First, the week in 2019 finds that right now there's no plans to actually invade in the country, which means any re any sort of invasion that we'd be ready for with U.S. forces happens after 2020 election, which means the voters don't matter. But secondly, the Associated Press writes that Trump is literally an isolationist and doesn't want to go to war with other countries, which means that he's not likely to attack Venezuela. Third, going to 2018 finds that advisors actually check a lot of uh, sorry, is going to check Trump and prevent him from doing a first strike within Venezuela. And fourth, because they don't want to draw Russia into this uh, sort of argument, which is why. Uh, which is crucial because Tur Turkey in 2016 finds the United States doesn't want to go to war with Russia, they would be drawn in because they have vested interest. On this argument about Florida, one, we would tell you that the parts of Florida they talk about are incredibly really South Florida, which are already not voting for Trump, no reason he really cares about those voters. On the impact, two turns. First, Bo uh, Bo Bo Boaster writes in 2018 that the actual most likely form of intervention that doesn't make it to any of my dealings tells you that it would be a really special ops force that's already in the region that would go into the country and literally kill 3,500 3, people in Alice Maduro. But second, Beamer finds in 2018 that uh, the other most likely force is literally a non-violent approach where we sort of teach a resistance movement that uh, which, which he concludes literally leads to, works 75% of the time of non-violence leading into this country uh, of leading over Maduro's approach. Can I see your black ops, your special ops or whatever? Are y'all talking about the plugs for us too? Yeah. So wait, well, can you explain the last two turns that you're on? Or just, just show us the evidence for both. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then I'll ask, yeah. I need to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first one. Right here. <coughs> So cool. 
What was the term you said about your role that it was Lincoln to the US? Uh, yeah, it doesn't link into the Leland because this is not a United States like full intervention in the dealings. The reason is that the United States would not be a full intervention. Oh, okay. I'm going to start on the intervention. Sorry, where you starting? Starting on the intervention. Right. On our intervention argument, we'll concede to the defense that Trump doesn't want to intervene. They read two terms. The first thing they say is that special officers are going to be really efficient. First of all, the examples they give is from Panama. That's completely different. Panama was literally not even resisting. That's why the efficient operation was so efficient. But in Venezuela, where we have nationals that are going to respond back, of course there would be a violent war. Of course it's going to kill a lot of people. The second thing we say is that if it was so efficient as their evidence says, Trump should already follow through on it. He's definitely not just going to pursue it. Second thing they say, Oh yeah, they say something about like nonviolent approaches. There's no reason why we can't just do that in the sense quote. There's no reason why sanctions trade off with this. We say sanctions would simply trade off with intervention through the military. This term really doesn't apply. Let's go over the same tension about privatization. His terms about pri uh, it, uh, like uh, money not coming into the economy because of sanctions is <coughs> not unique. In fact, what the AQ evidence writes is that even before sanctions, no investment was coming in, meaning that investors just don't want to invest in Venezuela. Well, they're not going to invest regardless. Then, on our third contention of social reform, the first response he gets is from Roger saying that on net aid is decreased by 98%. We realize a couple of responses. Number one, we say it's already before before sanctions came in place, no aid was going to the people. In fact, the Brendan evidence says that before sanctions came in place, aid was not being distributed equitably. It wasn't going anywhere. So even then, they're losing the comparative. The only risk of aid actually going to people is in our world. But the second thing we say is that as a result of these his, uh, hedging his bets and needing to appeal to the people it's already reformed. They, they, they like literally don't even respond to our examples. First of all, we say they reform things like clap. The Eureka Tribune says that reform claps would actually distribute food to the program. But second, we give the the, use, uh, the example of Red Cross being allowed in. That's 650,000 people benefited. And for example, water is also being reformed, bringing water to 2.8 million people. The next response he says is that sanctions block aid. But again, this is also similar to the last response. Sanctions uh, didn't prevent aid from going to the people since Maduro was not giving aid to the people in the first place. We're also increasing aid. They're just not really responding to the argument. Then they say that reforms aren't going to go away after we remove sanctions. We say that 
that it will go away because then Maduro just gets access to his money and he can just give his money to the generals and private so he doesn't need to care about the people. The reason why he has to care about the people right now is because his generals aren't fully on his side because the sanctions targeting his economic resources. Now he has to focus on the people to hedge his bets and stay in power. Then they say that U.S. sanctions blocked NGOs, but this is entirely not unique as well. In fact, what the uh, Freedom House writes is that these NGOs were being constantly harassed even before sanctions came in place, and Maduro just does not like these NGOs. So even if the NGOs get access to the U.S. financial system, they're already being cast harassed, and we're not going to see any NGOs benefit regardless. Let's go to their case. So I think their first contention is about health and like shipments and doctor drains. All right, so first of all, what the New York Times writes is that there's a medicine shortage before sanctions came in place. In fact, what the New York Times analyzes is that in the 10 years prior to sanctions coming in place, literally no one had medicine before. What this indicates is that it's more about Maduro's mismanagement, not necessarily access to medicine or abroad. We say this changes in our world when he lets in things like the Red Cross come in so they can actually distribute aid and give aid and medicine to the right people. The second thing here is the Brookings evidence, which index their evidence about from DW at the 300 evidence, uh, 300,000 people. What the Brookings evidence writes is that this evidence is terrible and not causal about the unique impact of sanctions. In fact, what they find is that sanctions aren't even responsible for the impact. You should prefer our, uh, prefer our evidence about what's happening in the status quo. That's the only uniqueness. Then, the, uh, yeah, on doctor training, we say the doctors aren't going to come back if they've already left. They've probably already settled somewhere else. They're not just going to give up their new life and go back to a country, especially when it's probably not going to be as good as it was in their last place. Then, Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. let's go to the second tension about economic growth. First of all, with the Wall Street Journal evidence from our case indicates is that hyperinflation is already decreasing right now. This is critical because what the Brookings Institute found was that before sanctions came in place, inflation was already skyrocketing. That indicates a couple things. Number one, that means that there was no inflation, that was, or the inflation problem was already existing before sanctions. Sanctions are unique. But number two, that means we have the only risk of solvency insofar as inflation is on a downward trend now that we have sanctions, whereas before it wasn't. Uh, yeah. Also, the AQ applies here because economic growth wasn't going to come in regardless. They say the international markets were off and the economy was going to crash, but things like oil, number one, the oil economy and the oil industry was going to crash regardless. For example, Boris Rice the oil industry was completely mishandled, so PDFSA was going to collapse regardless. That indicates that the, the economy was already passed to decline. If anything, that's a turn for us because we say by restricting the ability to sell the oil, now Maduro is forced to diversify and create an actually Wait, sustainable economy. Oh, yeah, yeah, debt restructuring. Okay, yeah. So the AQ evidence also applies to debt restructuring because they need investors on their side in order to make it happen. But it, if the investors were not on their side before, then there's no guaranteed debt restructuring happens. So the second thing we say is that debt restructuring isn't going to solve anything. They're just going to push the problem further down the line. For example, if you just restructure debt past 30 years, Chavez and Maduro that just keeps spending without any limit. So they're probably going to do the same thing as well. We would also say that in our world, when we let's say to the people, that's a much more direct impact than hoping that debt restructuring works in the international investors, especially when investors are like really sketchy. Yeah. Uh, can we see the piece of evidence that says like no one got aid or something? Like Brendan? Yeah, sure. Are New York Times? I don't know. <coughs> New York Times was on it. There was a medicine shortage before saying so. No, that's fine. I'll see that. So if you're an NGO before uh, sanctions came in place, you would probably be dead because Maduro is harassing the NGOs. So like the NGOs weren't able to do their operations. Yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, I guess let's go to your case, right? It's like I'm looking at this like wise evidence, right? Sure. 
And how does Wise Board get us a number of about like 350 people dying? Well, the DW evidence is the one that gets the number. Well, it's like citing Wise Board. So okay, how does sure. Wise Board get So you're probably going to tell me if it like doesn't look at trends before sanctions or something. Uh, okay, so Wise Board gets his uh, sort of analysis. <coughs> A lot of economic trends that are happening before sanction and the proposed policies that were okay, happening after okay. sanctions. What? No, it doesn't look at what was happening before sanctions. What is the methodology? Well, How does it come to the 300,000? He released a pro debt because he saw these people like trashing him and then he was like, these people don't know economics. And he released another article that was like, we do look at them. Okay. They're looking at false So, what was, I guess, oh yeah, that's fine. So, where do you apply wise words? So like the medicine crisis, right? What yeah, was the trend no, no, of no, medicine no, access? Okay, and, and the economy, right? What was the rate of like inflation before sanctions came to place? It was like 100%. Okay, was it increasing or decreasing? Uh, I don't know. It was increasing. Okay, sure. Cool. All right. Does that matter? matter? Yeah, it does matter because it proves that sanctions aren't the reason why inflation is rising. It was rising if before. If they were like 150% before. No, it wasn't 150%. It was like Sanctions were in 2015. Inflation in 2015. Real sanctions were in 2017. Those were very targeted. Sure, sure. In 2017, it was at like 800%. Which is still way more manageable than the millions of percent. It literally went from like 10% to 800 in like the year before sanctions. So I'm asking no, if we never, is. I mean, okay, you can dispute facts, but like before sanctions Google came it. in place, like, I mean, Google I did. The I can pull the inflation chart. Not nearly to the effect it was okay, after. It fine. went from like, that's time. No, no, I'm saying that's fine. Uh, okay. We're obviously not going to get to um, I also just don't, don't think it really matters what it was does. happening before the crisis, right? Yeah. Because we tell you they can't solve the crisis with sanctions. But, okay, first of all, he wasn't going to solve the crisis. And second of all, he can because inflation is now decreasing. Yeah, so it's at like 15,000%, which was way more than it was Yeah, and it was at like millions at one point. So obviously During sanctions. That's what right, but that trend started before sanctions came in place. Dude, but it's All right, like, I'm it's gonna like take a if a trend's like this, and obviously, like trends this, are like obviously something right. happened here. So let's go to doctor train, right? Yeah. So if you're a doctor and you leave Venezuela, like where are you now? You're probably like, you're educated, so you probably got a job in like a different country, right? Maybe like Colombia or something? No, they're educated, so we're like developed countries are willing to give visas to them, right? So if you're in like one of these other countries, why would you go back to Venezuela? Yeah, no, 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 I'm saying educated populations I would like back doctors. I, my culture, like I'm a Venezuelan, so I probably want to go back to where the country I like grown up is and where my culture is. Wait, why though? Because it also you, doesn't probably, matter. You, I mean, you left for a reason. We also don't have to win that they go back. Obviously, more doctors not leaving is an automatic good thing. So, like, more if we stop the doctors from leaving. Yeah, but if we remove sanctions. Cool. All right. <laughs> Can we see you know, you're all harassing the kind of Yeah. Uh, this is like a whole lot of people in there. And you also said like you know, like really drunk. Okay, sure. Yeah, you can like say something else now. Yeah, sure.
we're just going to give Arcus Vick. And I'll let on my kiss pitch. I'll actually wait first. Two reasons you prefer us. First is on probability, because currently our respawn and tax evidence finds that the economy is going down 37%. Now imports are decreasing 39%, and medical imports have fallen 80, 89%. He has an incentive to try and help the economy in both worlds. They have not responded to that argument on their case page. Also, our impact comes first because they force multiplier for every other impact. If we win a 1% chance of state collapse, it will destabilize the region, which makes poverty more likely and leads to state collapse in other countries, which is a prerequisite to the argument because our impact is multi generational, their impact is single generational. But more importantly, they have pretty much conceded the fact that inflation was only 150% before sanctions, and now it's, it was over 10 million after the imposition of sanctions. They try and save the Wall Street Journal evidence says that hyperinflation is going down now. However, it was not as bad beforehand. A, Maduro tried to pass exchange rate-based stabilization beforehand, but sanctions prevented him from doing so. And B, our pitiful evidence says that sanctions were the nail in the coffin that led to the total economic destruction of the Venezuelan economy. He would have done it if he would have had access to dollar-based financial systems, but they were taken away by sanctions. Then they say they were risk of solvency because inflation is going down now. However, this is not true. Cross apply the straight times evidence on their first contention here, because the straight times evidence says that even if inflation is decreasing now, people still can't afford to access to food, which means it doesn't matter if inflation is going now. The only permanent solution is exchange rate-based stabilization, which the policy that we advocate for and the policy that they don't respond to. But then, they say that oil is going to crash anyways and it's a turn into restructuring, restructuring forces liberalization. However, our reason and tax evidence says that they don't need outside investment. They can just do it on their own. And it worked before sanctions. The oil industry was obviously working beforehand. No more is why this is good changes. Maduro still is an incentive in our world. On the debt restructuring argument, they say we need investment. No, they don't. Because the Weismart evidence literally says that people have an incentive to come in because oil is so much of a big deal. They're going to do it anyway. Latin America has the biggest oil reserves. But then they say Chavez, um, Chavez and Maduro don't care and about their leg. However, Maduro, once again, has an incentive to do it in both worlds because it's going to help him and help his elites and it's going to bolster popular support, which is why it happens anyways. On the Weismart indict, they, we literally have a product to their evidence that says all of his stuff is faulty, but he went back and finalized his trends, which prefer our evidence there. But more importantly, they have conceded that millions of people are currently suffering from a food crisis, which is driving mass migration. Our impact scenario has no defense and one, a 1% risk outweighs their case because the WLA finds that 3 million people have fled because of sanctions. Three reasons you prefer the exchange rate based stabilization. A, all he needs is access, that's what he gets from sanctions. B, cryptocurrency proves that he tried to do it before. C, it's worked empirically seven out of seven times. More importantly, any risk of offense in the refugee case is going to win us debate. At the top of their case, they have cold dropped the Wall Street Journal evidence of the first contention that is the general response to everything they read. That literally says that all of the reforms they talk about are inherently short term in nature and will then eventually be pulled back by Maduro. That also applies to their aid argument because he could just change back. But also, on the Wi Fi line on aid, they say that Maduro wasn't accepting aid before sanctions. However, 300,000 people are now independently at risk because of sanctions. That wasn't something that existed beforehand. And, or literally, it says from 2018 to 2019, there was an 80, 98.7% decrease in imports, which is the reason why, even if it was happening before, it's become inherently worse with sanctions. They say Maduro didn't prevent aid from getting in the first place. However, understand that Maduro wasn't the one getting all of the aid. Private companies in Venezuela were also receiving aid prior, which means that A, even if it's Maduro's mismanagement, we still have partial solvency because other private equities are coming in and providing aid, but B, the aid is going away in their world. That's why we're winning the nuance on this debate. They say that 650,000 people were getting aid, but the evidence literally says it was planned. It never says it got there. That is because sanctions are independently preventing them from getting there in the first place. They've also dropped all of the impact defense about how sanctions are in general bad. They have conceded that sanctions only work 10% of the time, and empirics prove that they have never forced out a leader. They literally have no offer to this contention, and 98% medical imports, private companies can still do it. He does reform on this. He says very specifically the reason as to why they're reforming right now is because Maduro has lost the ability to consolidate power at the top, which means he's to pander to people. He actually, he actually has to pander to the people because he has less money to give to journals in the first place. That's why the Rendon evidence says that compared to he has less power at the top. That's why he's pandering to people. If you remove his, if you remove the pressure at the top, he has no incentive to actually care about the people. This is why pre sanctions he wasn't doing the reforms that we're talking about. The second response they, the second response they say is that oh, Arvin says 650,000 people are going to get aid. Number one, it's very good. It says the Red Cross is coming in and have all the equipment.
government to get the aid to the people. Number two, the U.S. evidence would say drop in their, in their story. It says the hundreds of kids are already being affected with the reforms that are happening right now. Copper is very, very good. But number two, they say that, oh, private companies can send in aid. But this is just true. This doesn't make any sense. Maduro could probably just send like a police officer and just like kill the person in charge of the private company. There's no reason why just because the private companies exist in, 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 Minnesota, in Venezuela, they necessarily get around the Maduro government. The free mass evidence is very, very good. It says that anyone who supported NGOs and activists within the country did not allow humanitarian aid to actually get the people who was really raiding NGOs in the status quo. And this is the thesis of our argument the entire round. Even if they win 100% in their case offense, the fact that none of the revenue from oil, from whatever, the private sector, from NGOs, whatever it is, was not going to the people means we're the only rescue office for structurally reforming the way that the Maduro runs the Venezuelan government. So the only way we can get the things equitably distributed is if you have sanctions, you put a, a, a cost in the decision, decision calculus. Oh, did you see anything else on it? Oh yeah, three hundred. Then they read the. Actually, uh, that's on their case. Um, yeah, but then on their on their uh, uh, argument about aid. Uh, sorry, their case to go for. They say the three thousand people are at risk, but they drop the Perkins index. The evidence indexes their evidence and says that these reforms are. Uh, sorry, these these uh, like uh, these like trends were going to happen regardless. This is a general thesis in their entire argument. This is because the crisis was started before. Maduro and Chavez were not great leaders. They were literally doing bad economic policy reforms. They're not actually getting sustainable long term growth. Their arguments were going to rely on the good faith of Maduro. So when the sanctions get removed, he's inherently going to pass his good policies. But these are the honor of Republican. A whole entire third contention. He's not going to do those things. This is going to cause another recession down the line. They never prove any evidence in their entire case that says that if we remove sanctions day one, he's going to implement these. Stabilization programs because it doesn't exist because he's not going to do so because he wasn't doing it before sanctions in the first place. But then we also say on the uh, we also say in the Wall Street Journal evidence they say that inflation is they say that inflation is uh, de- increasing uh, increasing during sanctions. But that was a trend that was happening before. That's also the CSI evidence and also the Brookings evidence. We say that compared to latest decreased by ninety five percent. If we remove sanctions, the trend would have continued to see gone upward. In fact, you can call the Wall Street Journal. It literally said that sanctions forced them to stop printing money, which is the reason as to why inflation happened in the first place. It's way better than their analytics uh, uh, analytics on it. But then let's go to their state collapse argument on uh, debt restructuring. They say that Maduro has an incentive because he wants to appeal to the people. He wants to avoid an economic collapse. Number one, no, he doesn't. Our third contention says the only incentive he has to appeal to the people is if he has less money to get to the generals in the first place. If absent sanctions, there's more oil revenue, more gold revenue going towards him. He can just feed it to the generals. There's no incentive for him to actually reform the economy in a meaningful manner. But number two, we say that even if this argument is true, you want meaningful long-term reform. You have to have investment. Just to that implement a stabilization program does not necessarily mean that Venezuela comes out of a recession in the first place. The only way that happens is if they get investment. The AQ evidence goes conceded. It says that absent sanctions, they no one wanted to invest in the Venezuelan market because it was so risky to invest in the first place. But then they. Give a bunch of wing, right? Even if they win 100% of their offense, so there's more economic growth in the long term. The fact that they were in donut evidence goes conceded as terminal defense on their argument because that revenue was not being distributed to people within Venezuela without being distributed to people in poverty. The only way to structurally reform that is by it's in a game. Okay. <coughs> Are you all good? I am. So why does Maduro not have an incentive to liberalize the economy in both worlds if it helps him in history? So let's think about this. Before 2017, was he liberalizing? No, before, no, he wasn't, right? And that's before sanctions, before oil sanctions. And the reason as to why is because there's no incentive for him to make the economy better if he can just get oil money and just like speed it to the mouths of generals. Is it entirely true that he didn't liberalize before the imposition of sanctions? Okay, I mean, you can't talk the about private it. sector accounted for like seventy-five percent of the industry. So, of so all so industry in like two thousand thirteen to two thousand sixteen. Okay, what percentage of the Four GDP was as a result of the private industry? The GDP, not just like the okay, industry. like like Tyler, like you're oh, saying. Oh, actually, seventy percent of the GDP. You're saying you're saying they're going to pass the state. You're going to say they're going to pass the state. Don't see it. Okay, okay, regardless, that doesn't matter. Okay, well, you're saying it's not true without calling. Okay, no, okay, okay, okay. You're saying that he's going to pass the stabilization program. Yes. Why wasn't this case of stabilization passed before? Our okay. argument is that it was being passed, but sanctions were still no, so, 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 That's been there. Your, your, nation the says, time. your nation evidence says that he couldn't restructure the debt. Those are two fundamentally different things. Yeah, you're looking at the wrong card. There's two warrants. First is exchange rate stabilization. Second is debt so your sax evidence. You're sax evidence. Is, those two things. No, no, Tyler, Tyler, your sax evidence says that sanctions stopped him the ability to do so. It does not say that he was going to do that. No, but the Valencia evidence we read in every single speech and the empirical analysis that has also gone conceded since A, he tried to pass a cryptocurrency to stabilize the economy. B, a cryptocurrency is Say, you don't talk about a fixed state. It would have been nice to be in a speech in no, 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 because there's a empirical bit of validation for Look, why Tyler, he would Tyler, 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 exchange rate stabilization the economy. Okay, the argument that we're making is that if Maduro caused inflation to happen, why are you trusting Maduro to solve inflation? Because he has a track record of trying to do good things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, obviously by starting the crisis in the first place. That, like, is, that doesn't make that any sense. Literally not our argument. Like, where do you, okay, I understand you can pass a stabilization program. Where do you ever prove that number one is successful in reducing inflation, that number two is going to be something okay. that's good for it's Venezuela? It's worked seven out of seven times in Latin America. That's different than, okay, sure, inflation. sure, sure. Maybe, maybe you worked in Chile, which is probably more democratic than Maduro is, but you're literally talking about a guy who put a general in front of their biggest oil industry. Like, I don't understand why you're yeah. like relying on him to reform the economy. So it's a simple question. Yes. Do you have any evidence that says 
Maduro, a really, really smart economist, apparently, is going to is going to fix the Venezuelan economy if you have that evidence or not. Well, that's, yes, that's, yeah, well, I think it's important to like think about it. Like everything that you say is so bad for the economy, like Chavez did, but Chavez also did this exchange rate based stabilization. And, okay, okay, okay. So, so, like, so, so like, Chavez, sure, so Chavez did it, right? So, so Chavez did it. But, I think it's important to realize that we're not saying that Maduro makes the correct economic decisions in every single chance. But we are saying absolutely. But you're not saying that. do this one program. No, 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 no. You, 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 you an incentive because that's what we Okay, so you're. Okay. Uh, just talk for thirty seconds. If you want. Uh, how's your day? It's all right. Uh, I, the. Uh, <coughs> right, right, okay. Um, mismanagement. What is the response to private firms and stuff? What? That. Like, oh, oh, so yeah, like, yeah, so, the so the private firm of the NGO. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was just like this isn't this doesn't mean anything. Like Maduro can still crack down on those private firms. Like there's no delineation as to why those are necessarily away from the grasp of the Maduro government. Okay. Venezuela is on the risk of state collapse. Millions of people are going into poverty. And they can see that every single empiric that millions of people are now going into poverty, which means we have only risk of solvency in this debate. Every single one of our impacts about Venezuela becoming a failed state turns all of theirs and is a prerequisite, which means in their world you have a failed state. Maybe there's some aid coming in, but the, aid, the, the, the state is literally failed, which means you should vote for us on the risk of solvency for allowing Maduro to do this one policy that we say has worked seven out of seven times in the past. It also outweighs our probability because we know that before, because of sanctions, that the, the economy went down 37%. We do not have to win that the economic crisis is due to sanctions. What we do have to, what we do tell you is that when Duro in a world without sanctions can solve it back, which we tell you is done in the past. They tell you that trends and regulations were before, but why not clearly concluded in a uh, sort of project that those trends that they were looking at were bad and that it's good to look at these 300,000 people because it looks like the sort of potential policy solutions that would have happened after sanctions. They say there's no incentive to sort of uh, improve the economy. One, we would say if it literally he would want to improve the economy to help his elites, which Tyler sort of alludes to you in summary. But two, they, uh, two we would tell you specifically that the Valencia evidence which is really good tells you that Chavez did this type of reform even if Maduro doesn't have necessarily sort of uh, uh, the best economic mind in every single case in this one case he does which is crucial because our wide run sacks evidence says that this can solve the crisis and it's worked seven out of seven times in the past they say he only appeals to people in there well no real warrant for this why this argument is true and we tell you it's a it just proven by past passionate which Tyler goes over in a summary things like cryptocurrency reform that was meant to help the people disprove this argument to be true then they say they need to uh, appeal to investors no our wide run evidence says they can literally do it by the themselves. If we win that there's a literally state collapse happening right now, which we do and they've not conceded it, there's only a risk of solvency for voting for us. On the aid argument, the Rogers evidence is pre really, really good on this question. It says because of sanctions, the amount of medical shipments has gone down 99%, which means it's not just about aid, it's about all medical shipments, which is definitely more important than aid. Also, the evidence about the Red Cross literally just says it's like going to planning, planning to go in, and not actually any people are going to be saved lives. Absorbing the evidence gives the reason for this and says that sanctions prevent it. You can now wait for us on probability because you know that there's a state collapse happening right now, and you know that aid companies have tried to go in before that we talked about, but you don't know that people were saved out of poverty. It's a pretty easy uh, FL. Okay, um, it'll start on their case and then our case. All right, everyone good? Go ahead. Yeah. All right. They basically can see the Wall Street Journal evidence that says inflation, number one, it says inflation has decreased by 95%. That, at that point, is like basically concedes the debate because if, if like they want to debate about risk or probability if inflation is already increasing at best, that's just terminal defense that their impact is not unique. But even then, the implications of trade makes this a twofold. Number one, that means that Maduro didn't even want to do the stabilizing part because he messed up the economy in the first place. If he really did want to stabilize the economy, he wouldn't have caused inflation to rise. He would have just agreed to the package outright. He's never going to do so. We say that's historically proven. But number two, we say that even if he does agree to the stabilizing package right now, in the future, he's probably going to mess up the package 
factors, regardless of them, mess up the economy again, meaning that they have no long-term impact. Those implications are basically conceded. But then we say that PS is only set to that, oh yeah, yeah. Then they say that if we allow sanctions, it will stabilize the program, then it generates the economy, uh, economic growth. But they never respond to the Brendan evidence that says that even if the economy fully stabilizes, even if you give them 100% of their offense, none of that revenue is actually going to the people. In fact, the Brendan evidence is very good at saying that all the revenue in the economy from back then literally did not go to the people. The AQ piece of defense has also conceded that no one wants you to invest. That means that stabilization packages won't even work because investors aren't willing to work with them. That's also terminal defense. Let's go to our case. The only response we get is this Rogers evidence that 98% of imports were decreasing. First of all, we say that none of the imports from before were actually going to the people. So this isn't offense for that. But the second thing we say is that it's agreeing to reform the status quo. Obviously, this doesn't happen overnight, but we say things like agreeing to the unit stuff to come in and also just agree to like, like water packages and stuff indicates that he wants to go to the people. We also get this response that 650,000 people, it wasn't because it, it's not happening so far. But we say the UNICEF evidence says that hundreds of thousands of people, kids are already getting benefited in the status quo. The reason why our third contention is really important is because it's the only risk of offense of any revenue or any single dollar or boulevard actually going to something that benefits the people. Insofar as before sanctions came in place, Maduro had no incentive to actually benefit the people. We need sanctions to pressure him into, into going into it. That also controls the internal link of the state collapse because if the economy is not reformed, then there is not going to, even if the economy crashes and or it really stabilizes, none of that money is going to go to the people. Oh yeah. Uh... Yeah, oh, even on its way, he says the destabilization in the pilot, the sanctions are going to allow to give money to the people. We say no, he has no incentive to actually give the money from the stabilization program. He's always just going to feed his generals like he did before sanctions. Otherwise, like at today's round, you should vote for uniqueness. It's getting better for the people right now because before sanctions, there was no benefit and the economy inflation is going down. Sure.